Hi, I'm Gabrielle Hoyt, the literary manager of Roundhouse Theater. I'm hosting a weekly series called Playwrights on Plays, which is part of the Roundhouse at Your House digital programming, fully funded by new contributions from the Roundhouse Board of Trustees. Every Thursday at 7 p.m., I'll spend an hour interviewing a different Roundhouse-affiliated theater maker about their work, their career, and a play that has influenced and inspired them. We'll also include time in those interviews for your questions, which, if you're watching live, you can type into the chat window on your screen. Each play we discuss is already free online for you to experience, so that you can continue to engage with theater throughout the week. This week, I'm so excited to speak to one of the most celebrated playwrights of the 21st century, Sarah Rule. A MacArthur Genius Award winner and multiple time Pulitzer Prize finalist, Sarah made her Broadway debut uh, in 2006 with In the Next Room or The Vibrator Play, which was also nominated for a Tony. Her plays have been produced at Lincoln Center, Playwrights Horizons, Second Stage, and around the country, including at Roundhouse Theater, which produced her work Stage Kiss in 2015. Sarah is also a celebrated poet and writer of nonfiction. Her book, 100 Essays I Don't Have Time to Write, was a Times Notable Book of the Year, and Letters from Max, a book of friendship co-authored with Max Ritfo, was published in 2018. In the past two months, she's written essays about art, life, and grief in the time of coronavirus for the New York Times and the Atlantic, and the keynote address she gave at the 2020 Whiting Awards was featured in Vanity Fair. I could list her awards and accomplishments and simply talk about how much this playwright means to me personally for the rest of the hour, but instead, welcome Sarah. Hi. Hi, um, it's wonderful to talk to you. Thank you for being here today. I'm so happy to. Yeah, um, so uh, we have a lot to discuss uh, this evening. You've chosen uh, two plays, a Baltimore Waltz by Paula Vogel and uh, Big Love by Chuck Me. But first, I do want to talk a little bit about you and how you're doing right now. I do have, I left my Sarah Rule Bible in the other room, but I do, I've, I'm surrounded by, by some of your works uh, and there's many more scattered uh, throughout my house. So uh, I'm, I'm so thrilled that we're gonna get to share a little bit uh, about you and, and the players that have influenced you for the next hour. Uh, so let's start with, uh, I I've, I've found that how are you doing is, is too difficult to question, <laughs> um, but but let's start with uh, what does your life uh, look like right now? You know, it's, it's interesting. I, I find myself asking people, how are you coping? Mm -hmm. of how are you doing? Because mm -hmm. how are you coping puts the emphasis on, you know, what things we can do to feel better as opposed to going into um, the grimness, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of grimness right now that we're all coping with. Um, and I find that I'm coping by trying to write a little bit every day, um, cooking, I'm with my kids, you know, three kids who are all um, being, you know, doing distance learning uh, and their school is quite heroic, I think. Um, trying to stay in touch with family, doing things like um, cooking with my mother who's in Chicago over Zoom. And, and she even taught me how to make gravy. I'm, I'm 46, I never learned how. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I, um, there have been pleasures uh, despite the grimness. Mm -hmm. And um, during this time, something that's been interesting has been hearing uh, how people's uh, playwrights relationship to writing has has changed or stayed the same during this time. Um, what were you working on before social distancing beca began and, and has that now changed or are there actually ongoing projects that you started mm -hmm. beforehand and that you're continuing now? Well, the biggest change for me, I guess, is to not be so focused on production because I was supposed to be, I guess, in a workshop of a new musical for the past two weeks, which was canceled. And then I was supposed to be in rehearsal starting today for a new play called Becky Nurse of Salem mm -hmm. that I did at Berkeley Rep. Um, in, when was that? In December, it feels like a lifetime ago. Uh, and we were supposed to start rehearsing at Lincoln Center, I think, next week. Um, so you know, shifting my thinking from the way a writer thinks when they're in production to the way a writer thinks uh, when they're deeply involved in a generative process for one thing. But also, 
you know, there's there's a lot going around the internet about how Shakespeare wrote King Lear uh, mm -hmm. during the plague. And my friend, Jim Shapiro, who wrote Shakespeare in a Divided America, which I highly recommend. Jim said it's not true. He didn't write Lear during the plague. It's, it's um, you know, it's a hoax. Uh, uh, I find that comforting. And I share that with my students at Yale because I think there is this American emphasis on productivity, this desire to optimize your time um, the, the, and, and thinking that you have to write King Lear during the plague is setting the bar very high. So I think even just re-engaging with your practice, re-engaging with what does it mean to write every day? What does it mean to spend time with your thoughts every day? Uh, I mean, it, it takes Buddhist masters years to be able to be in self-retreat by themselves in the Himalayas, you know, years of spiritual practice for them to uh, endure that solitary time. So I think for all of us, it's enough to get through, honestly. Mm -hmm. And, and great if you write the next King Lear, but it's enough to uh, survive and be healthy. I feel like even without an international crisis, King Lear is a fairly high bar. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, you are uh, uh, not just, uh, just, you are a playwright and also an essayist uh, and a poet. Um, has one of those uh, uh, types of writing kind of come to the fore at this moment, or have you continued uh, to write in multiple modes? I think the essay form has been interesting to me right now because I can kind of look at what's in front of me and try to make sense of it. I think imaginary landscapes feel very distant right now and hard to kind of pour one's mind and, sorry, Mike, I don't know what my kids are doing. <laughs> Uh, hopefully they're okay. Um, hard, hard to, hard to exit the world right now into an imaginary world when there's such a sense of urgency mm -hmm. in day to day life. So I think the essay form has been helpful right now. Yeah. Um, I have written a poem or two. Um, I tend to like to write occasion poems, so I, I, I've been continuing that practice. Um, on the on the note of your essays, uh, you've had three uh, notable works of nonfiction recently, uh, one in the New York Times, uh, one in the Atlantic, uh, and then uh, your keynote speech was in Vanity Fair. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious uh, what it was like to be putting uh, what very, very personal um, and, and intimate moments uh, into the public sphere at this moment? I find myself happy to be connecting with others right now. And if I'm connecting over Zoom or connecting through the written word, um, all of it seems useful. Mm -hmm. So speaking personally right now or speaking from the heart right now, see if, if that's useful, then I'm happy, happy to be doing that. Yeah, it also, it also seemed to me reading them, um, and, and as a member of uh, the theater field, two, two of which of those, uh, you know, those essays really touched on, it was really comforting, I think, to see someone I consider a theatrical leader uh, mm -hmm. writing so eloquently and with such thought about that moment. Uh, Paula Vogel, who we'll be talking about later, has certainly been uh, showing a great deal of, of feels like public theatrical leadership, especially with her her bake offs. And I'm curious if you felt uh, a feeling of responsibility, uh, just given your position in, in the field, uh, to to be writing uh, these essays. If that was on your mind as well, uh, I do feel a sense of responsibility to the field. I mean, I feel so concerned about the furloughed workers um, in the theater community right now. Um, I find it devastating to think that there's this sort of army of highly trained, um, beautiful souls and friends who are out of work as, and not only out of a livelihood, but out of a sense of purpose mm -hmm. right now. So I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, and I wrote the, the piece in the Atlantic, which maybe I can, for audiences who, who wouldn't know what it is, I can speak about. I mean, I, I guess I wrote it 
for myself to think about and for my husband too, um, our, uh, my, my husband's father died um, in early March. I mean, my sense of time is so strange right now. It might've even been late February. Um, and he died of a heart attack in his sleep. And looking back, it might have been COVID. We don't know because he had underlying conditions and he just woke up and he was dead. Um, and at first it was early enough in the pandemic where my husband thought, oh, I'll, I'll buy a ticket by myself. I'll fly back to California and go to a funeral. And then it seemed like, no, no one's flying. We can't do that. So we zoomed into his memorial. And so the piece was a meditation about what that is, you know, what is a Zoom memorial ritual? Um, can there be a sense of ritual in a Zoom memorial? Can there be catharsis? Uh, so in that sense, I guess I, I, I wrote it as a, as a private catharsis um, to, to help get through the experience. But if it's useful to others who, I mean, I'm sure countless other people are doing the same thing. And I've been thinking about the theater too as as a ritual. One thing that's lost in all the the kind of amazing Zoom soliloquies that are being created is a sense of ritual, which really requires you to get out of your house to go meet others at the same time, mm -hmm. knowing that they too have put enough importance, placed enough importance on the moment to leave the house to get dressed, to be at a place at the same time for a thing to begin. Um, to be present together and then for it to end. And I think that's, you know, funerals, um, church, Shabbat, um, uh, theater, uh, they have in common this bodies in space ritual phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So feeling the lack of that um, sorely made me want to write about it. Yeah, thank you. Um, it also occurs to me, uh, even the ritual of gathering in a classroom yes uh, is is missing right now um and and you are also um along with uh Paula Vogel who we'll be discussing later um a prolific and and gifted teacher i was lucky enough to learn from you along with so many others um what has what has teaching looked for you uh at this moment well you know i haven't technically been teaching this semester at Yale, and I really miss it. Um, I think the times when I do get to teach or pop into other people's classrooms and teach have felt like some of the the most engaged, grounded times I've had. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. I So I, I went to uh, um, Mary Zimmerman's classroom recently at Northwestern. Uh, she just directed an opera version of Eurydice um, in LA, which again, it feels like another century ago, even if it was February. Um, and Mary was reflecting about how hard it is to teach on Zoom and saying, I think it's okay that I'm sharing this with you. I mean, she was saying, you know, I'm not Christian, but I remember a Bible passage um, that says, when two or more of you are here, like I think it's the disciples, when 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 two or more of you gather, I am in your midst. Mm -hmm. Something that apparently Christ told his disciples. And Mary was talking about that feeling of what's that 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 sense of presence when two or more people gather, um, and how can you have that on Zoom? Uh, so I know a lot of teachers are feeling that way. And I guess what I feel when I walk into these Zoom classrooms, or I visited Ann Bogart's class um, at Columbia, and again, Mary's class was more centralized with folks in Chicago, and and students were everywhere around the world. Um, you know, someone in Brooklyn, someone in Taiwan. Um, I forget where else they were, but I I did feel there was a sense of the sacred, a sense of it's our intention to gather. So we feel this third thing, you know, this, this sense of presence that's coming in just because of the strength of those intentions, mm -hmm. but it's not the same and we can't pretend that it's the same. Um, I want to make sure that we talk a little bit uh, more specifically about your playwriting, uh, given uh, that uh, I know many folks tuning in uh, know and, and love your work. 
uh, and and um, I I wanted to start with um, so uh, for me at least I became familiar with your work uh, in 2006 with the Lincoln Center production of The Clean House, uh, which was uh, life changing. <laughs> mm -hmm. For me, uh, in that I didn't, I didn't know theater could do those things. Mm -hmm. um, but something I'm, I'm curious about is that your uh, dramatists, uh, who, who really you became known uh, for this uh, trademark melding of, of poetry and playwriting, um, and for uh, tweaking, if not completely discarding, uh, an American tradition of, of realism. And something I'm curious now, uh, given that we're, we're quite far from uh, 2006 uh, mm -hmm. and from kind of the early aughts where, you know, you won your Genius Award, you were nominated for a Pulitzer. Um, how, given uh, the success of, of your style, um, how, how have you come to innovate and evolve as a, as a playwright, knowing that something you were doing worked so well. How do you find uh, the ability or the urge to continue changing? Because something I've so admired about your plays over the years I've been reading them has been how much you continue to uh, evolve and invent with your style. Oh, that's so lovely. Um, I try not to analyze what I'm doing or how I'm changing too much mm -hmm. while I'm in the process of it. I mean, I, in a way, I think that's why we need great dramaturgs, uh, great critics to, to create that framework. Um, because I think if the artist is too aware of how they're changing and what they're doing, um, you know, too aware of even the voice, like, like sometimes um, with Yale students who ask me about um, voice, how do I know if I have a voice? Is this my voice? How is my voice changing? I think of the metaphor of tickling that, you know, you can't, you can't actually tickle yourself. It's very hard to make yourself, you can, but you won't laugh. Mm -hmm. um, so it reminds me of, 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 it's very hard to have that self-knowledge while doing it. It's hard to have a voice while, t it's funny while talking, you know, to, to analyze your voice while speaking, to yeah. analyze your song while singing it. Um, much easier to be full throated um, and not think about what you're doing. So I, I don't mean to squirrel out of your question, but awesome. I think duration and longevity is very hard to do in the American theater. I do think um, the field likes to discover um, an artist and, and, and their way of seeing the world and to honor that for a time and then to really look for, for new innovators. So to keep going, to keep working, to keep being engaged is uh, it's a long road and you do it because you love it and because and because you must. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing Horton Foote at a new dramatist luncheon when he was about 80 and he had gone through times where the critical establishment in New York was really like, Meh, you know, was not interested in what Horton Foote was doing. And he was talking about that time and he said, and, and I wrote every day. And he said, I'm gonna leave this luncheon and I'm going to write. And I loved that. You know, I loved that, the dailiness of that. Mm -hmm. um, something something else that I wanted to ask uh, about your style, and you, you mentioned it earlier that, I mean, in uh, in your poetry, in your plays, certainly there's a sense of touching the otherworldly. There's, and, and even talking about the idea of presence, it feels like again and again, you come back to something uh, something beyond us or something, was something beyond what we can touch or what we can experience um, in ev in the everyday. Um, and I'm, I'm curious if, uh, and, and let me know if this question makes sense, but I'm curious if, if going about your life, that is something that you experience, that you sense that there, or if uh, it is only in writing that you become aware of those aspects of life and, and feel need to express them? I think uh, one writes as one sees, you know? So uh, if I'm interested in the otherworldly or if I'm interested in transcendence in my writing, it must be something I'm interested in, in general. Mm -hmm. um, 
Hmm. Trying to think of an example. I mean, when I wrote this play, The Oldest Boy, um, it was about reincarnation and it was about the idea that this uh, teacher loses, um, or, you know, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, if, um, if you lose your teacher, you look for their reincarnation in the body of a, of a young baby. And I remember hearing about this and thinking how, how otherworldly, how surreal. Um, and then I heard a story uh, through my babysitter who is Tibetan and she said, oh, that happened to my friend. Um, they have a restaurant in Boston and one day someone knocked and said, your child's a reincarnation of a very high Lama. You have to send your child to India to be educated. Um, and I said, well, what did they do? Because to me, it seems so incomprehensible to, to let your child go to a monastery at a young age and be educated. And she said, well, of course, it was a very high honor. They let the child go. Mm -hmm. um, so in the case of that play, uh, which has, you know, in, in a way, very otherworldly themes, um, it also came from a very concrete story that was told to me, you know, in my kitchen by someone who I knew very well. Mm -hmm. um, and I did bucketfuls of research. So there were suitcases full of research I was doing. And, and I think the writing of that play changed me and changed um, how I think about reincarnation. It's not how I didn't set out to have my views changed, but uh, writing the play changed me as a person. Um, on this note of source material, actually, because it's it's interesting that that um, uh, you know I've, I, you you just mentioned uh, a play that you were inspired to 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 write after you uh, had a conversation and and deals with Tibetan Buddhism. You know, I've got here a play based on whoop, wrong one, no right one, no this one. Um, a play based on Greek drama or Greek uh, Greek myth. Another one based on you know early Christian drama, passion play. Um, You've, you've got, uh, you know, uh, in the next room is based on 19th century gynecological practices, uh, clean houses as, uh, all over the place and, and a lot of original things in there as well. Um, wh what um, it, do you feel, is there a common trend or theme um, about what inspires you or is the kind of eclectic nature of it part of your, uh, what interest, sorry, that doesn't quite, um, uh, I think, where, yeah. where do you find inspiration is I guess what I'm asking. I mean, I think every play has a different um, seed, a different kernel, but I think one thing that unites them is a, a real interest in mythic structures, things that are collective and larger than us and how they relate to the quotidian, to the everyday. And um, my kids make fun of me because they say I always write about death and love and they think I should search for some new, some new material. But um, I, I think those, those are the big ones. Are there other things? That's, I mean, that's. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that's also part of why maybe it is that I found it very um, comforting to be returning to your plays this week. And I think part of it is that uh, belief in, in, and, and, uh, repetition of and repurposing of, of a mythic structure. There's something that feels um, both universal and very ambitious about it, I guess. Well, I think the moment we're living through feels very Greek. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've been rereading the Greeks right now and the the scope of this plague. I mean, it's it's the whole world. It's every generation. It's every uh, corner of the world. Um, it affects every sector of society. So when you're dealing with that scale of tragedy, um, that scope, I think the, the Greeks are comforting because they understand things in extremis. Yeah, and also are not afraid of uh expressing it right in in the kind of epic scale that it is uh that it feels like it is yeah 
Um, on that on that note, let's turn to Baltimore Waltz uh, by Paula Vogel. I was so thrilled that you chose this, uh, mm -hmm. getting to um, talk about Paula Vogel with, with Sarah Rule. I, I think there are people who would pay lots of money to do that. So I'm thrilled I get to do it for my job. Um, we uh, we asked uh, playwrights to pick a play that uh, has inspired and sustained them. Uh, you picked both Baltimore Waltz and Big Love. Uh, so let's start with Baltimore Waltz. And for those who haven't gotten the chance to read or see it, do you mind just giving a very brief summary of uh, the play? So Baltimore Waltz is, is it's gonna make me cry talking about it. It's a play Paula wrote for her brother, Carl, who died of AIDS and Paula was incredibly close to Carl. So there's um there's an amazing letter at, at the beginning of the play. C can you read that? Are you yeah. able to? Yeah, let me grab it. Okay. Um, uh, do you want me to go through the whole thing or is there a, a, a portion? Is the, the letter to Carl section? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so she mentions that this, uh, is a letter that he, uh, wrote to her after his first bout with pneumonia at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. March, 1987, dear Paula, I thought I would jot down some of my thoughts about the, shall we say, production values of my ceremony. Oh God, I can hear you groaning. Everybody wants to direct. Well, I want a good show, even though my role has been reduced involuntarily from player to prop. First, concerning the choice between a religious ceremony and a memorial service. I know the family considers my Anglican observances as irrelevant as Shinto. However, I wish prayers in some recognizably traditional form to be said. Prayers that give thanks to the creator for the gift of life and the hope of reunion. For reasons which you appreciate, I prefer a woman cleric, if possible, to read the prayers. Here are two names, Phoebe Coe, Epiphany Church, the Reverend Doris Mote, Holy Evangelists. Please be sure to make a generous contribution from the estate for the cleric. As for the piece of me I leave behind, here are your options. One, open casket, full drag. Two, open casket, bum up. You'll know where to place the calla lilies, won't you? Number three, closed casket, interment with the grandparents. Four, cremation and the burial of my ashes. Five, cremation and dispersion of my ashes in some sylvan spot. I would really like good music. My tastes in these matters run to the highbrow. Parades, P.O. Jesu from his Requiem, uh, Gluck's Dance of the Blessed Spirits from Orfeo, uh, Le Le La Vergine uh, de Angeli from Verdi's Forza. But my favorite song is I Dream of Genie and I Wouldn't Mind a Spiritual Like Steal Away. Also, perhaps, Near My God to Thee. Be. Didn't Jeanette McDonald sing that divinely in San Francisco? Finally, would you read or have read A.E. Hausman's Loveliest of Trees? Well, my dear, that's that. Should I be laying with Grandma and Papa Ben? Do stop by for a visit from year to year and feel free to chat. You'll find me a good listener. Love, brother. So, so I think, I think oh, I oh, I I'm I'm echoing. echoing. Hmm, how do I stop echoing? That's interesting. Uh, maybe a little echo from the spirit world. Um, I, I think it's extraordinary that she chose to publish the the letter from Carl, uh, and it, it the whole play to me feels like it has that sense of talisman uh, and ghost. So the the play follows. I mean, ironically, the play is sort of a comedy it, until it's not. Um, it follows uh, Anna, who's a teacher, um, a kindergarten teacher, and uh, and her brother, and they go on this kind of romp through Europe. Um, and at the beginning, you, you think that there's this danger of the kindergarten teacher acquiring um, this absurd disease that, that you can only ca catch in kindergartens um, from toilet seats. Uh, and then and, and they, they run around Europe looking for a cure to this terrible disease. Uh, and, and then you realize at a point that actually it's Carl who's sick and he has AIDS and they have one last waltz in the hospital. And you realize they've sort of been in the hospital the whole time and this dream of going to Europe is a fantasy of the siblings being able to see all these things they'd always dreamed of seeing together. Uh, and I saw this play at Brown University when I was a, I think a junior. And uh, my father had recently died and I was just back at school. And um, 
and I was with my friend whose father had died of AIDS. And um, we just sat there and sobbed our eyes out uh, when, when, um, when the brother and sister dance in the hospital. And it was such a, a, a catharsis and such a kind of sense of being seen by a play. I mean, I think we often think of seeing plays and not being seen by plays. And I really felt seen by that play profoundly. Mm. And it was before I'd met Paula and before she was my teacher. Um, so I saw that play, I fell in love with that play, I fell in love with Paula, and then she became my teacher the following year. Wow, that's that's amazing. Um, I, I'm consistently so amazed that uh, Paula Vogel's contributions to the theater have been so immense and yet her legacy as a teacher is also the, mm -hmm. I mean, the number of playwrights she's fostered and inspired. Um, yeah. I, I was, I was excited to talk with you about, about this play too, given that um, it's about, uh, it's about processing trauma or, or at least in, in part that, which is certainly something I've been thinking a lot about recently. And Paula chooses to take us on this journey through fantasy, through high comedy, through raunch, mm -hmm. uh, in order to uh, explore what processing trauma looks like. And I wondered what your thoughts were on the benefits of uh, artistic processing of trauma in, in that way, not through mm -hmm. realism, through a play in, in which you see a character whose brother is dying in a hospital, but a, a play in which we go on this fantasy journey before this realization. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is the key to Paula's plays and also to her teaching is that I remember her saying to me, I had come back from time off after my father died and was having trouble writing. Mm -hmm. And Paula said, you have to look at the thing indirectly, the same way you look at the sun indirectly. And she said, if I had set out to write a play about how my brother died of AIDS, I wouldn't have gotten out of bed, much less written the play. But if I thought, oh, I'll write a play about a brother and sister taking a romp through Europe and there will be a third man, um, you know, who's reminiscent of the of the third man in, in the Orson Welles film, then then I could, then the content gets unleashed. So Paula is always playing that trick with form, with using form as a conduit to the most disruptive emotion. Um, and that was an enormous lesson to me, I think, formally from her. Mm -hmm. It seems to me then that you're hearing you talk about it, that your play, I mean, of, of your many plays, uh, Eurydice in particular feels like an, an heir to, to this one. Absolutely. I think also how Paula puts an artifact or talisman from real life, Carl's letter, in the play itself. Mm -hmm. And in Eurydice, there are a number of things like that. Like there are some directions from my father's that my father wrote to me um, about how to get from our house in Chicago to our grandparents' house in Iowa. And that's a little fragment that's inside the play. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. And I've read and seen Eurydice many times. <laughs> um, it was also uh, you know, so interesting reading this play, knowing that it was written um, uh, within uh, and against uh, the backdrop of AIDS uh, and thinking about the kind of art that has yet to be created mm -hmm. uh, regarding uh, what we're currently undergoing together uh, mm -hmm. in this pandemic. And I'm wondering if you think there are any specific uh, thoughts, lessons, ideas, fragments that artists can take from this play as they begin to think about how to process what's happening now through their art. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we won't know, but I do think it's it's interesting to think about the AIDS crisis and to think about the trauma that the world went through, the trauma that the theater community in particular went through. Um, and... <laughs> you know, how long really it took to absorb, um, for, for culture to absorb the trauma of, of, of AIDS, which is still ongoing, but, you know, it wasn't, 
it wasn't immediate. I mean, it took it took how many plays before Angels in America was written? It took how many plays before Baltimore Waltz was written? Um, I think individuals process trauma and collectives process trauma and we're all kind of in conversation with each other. Yeah, I mean, I, I also, I feel, I mean, one of, uh, in, in both Baltimore Waltz and Angels, there's uh, an embrace of those incongruities putting, uh, I mean, hilarious comedy or, or in the, you know, in the case of, of, of Paula, I mean, this, the Anna is also kind of going through this, sleeping her way through Europe yeah, exactly. um, mm -hmm. and juxtaposing that right up against uh, the immense tragedy that's going on mm -hmm. around them. And that also feels uh, very helpful to me right now, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the, the blend of genre also is, is instructive to me, the blend of dark and light the refusal to only see loss in terms of the valence of despair, but also the to find the humor. And you see that in Carl's letter, you know, that he's writing this very poignant letter, but also talking about putting Kala lilies, you know, in his casket, in his in his bum, you know. <laughs> and she and that's what she begins with. And that's sort of a portal you know, a, a portal into the the blend of dark and light and high and low that I think is in most of Paula's work. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, and and yours as well, certainly. I mean, gosh, rereading The Clean House uh, where uh, the perfect joke is also a deadly weapon that can kill you. I mean, what an amazing exploration of, of grief too, uh, to, to and and, putting them to, together in that way as, as you do uh, in, in your play, The Clean House feels similar to me to what we're talking about. Mm. Yeah, I, I do think I, I, I tend to resist, um, you know, comedy or tragedy as a, as a single designation. Yeah, and also um, in, in many of your plays too, I mean, as I'm not, I'm forget the, I'm not the, dozenth person to have said this, but the mundane and the magical living right next to each other also feels so generative for you. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And, and Paula as well. Um, on that note, we've also chosen uh, to talk about Chuck Me's Big Love, which um, I don't know if you knew when you picked it, uh, was scheduled for Roundhouse's mm -hmm. uh, 2020 season at the very end. And of course, uh, that is now postponed. We are hoping to bring it to audiences in the future. Uh, can you briefly, uh, once again, just describe that play and, and a bit of what it means to you? Well, I didn't know that, but how serendipitous. I mean, I, I partly picked Chuck's play because I've been thinking about him a lot during this pandemic. For some reason, I was reading his uh, memoir, A Nearly Normal Life, which was actually the only book I was able to read from start to finish during the pandemic. And I think the reason is his voice is so immediate and he he's talking about having polio as a child. And then he's talking about the search for vaccine, um, an epidemic, talking about how isolated he was as a child um, when he was in the isolation wards, how he never, you know, the uncertainty, not knowing if he would get better. And then he talks about aesthetically how that experience shaped his life how fragmentation became a kind of aesthetic choice and a, and, a, and a moral way of looking at the world when your world is that disrupted. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, f I feel like, um, speaking of Eurydice, I think that play owes a big debt to Chuck Me because his way of looking at the Greeks and looking at mythic architectures and then kind of putting his own talismans inside of them was hugely influential. Um, and his kind of um, poetic use of stage directions. And, you know, funnily enough, I never got to see Big Love. It's one of those great missed productions where Les Waters is a, is a frequent collaborator of mine and a dear friend. And, and I always wanted to see Les's production of Chuck's Big Love and I never got to see it, but uh, I can read it. And I and I also wanted to 
choose Chuck's work because he's so dedicated to having free work online. Yeah. And um, and you all were hoping that whatever plays were chosen were free and online. And, and Chuck's been doing that for years and years. Um, and I think there's such a joy in that play, such a joy and pleasure and abandon and um, life force in that play that I love. And I love to just how the, um, the bodies, you know, the way he scripts the bodies on stage doing what the bodies do, um, the, the liberation um, is stunning. I mean, I, 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 I didn't give you a synopsis at all, but. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's Greek. It's Greek. I just went on at length. People can find it. It's um. I was gonna look this up before I talked to you, and now I forgot. But it's based on the myth of the Danaids, I think. That right. seems right. Um, but it's it's uh basically fifty daughters have been long ago promised in marriage to fifty sons. The daughters still want to get married. Uh, murder and mayhem ensue, and right. of course, uh, Chuck Me has transposed it into kind of this mythic. Italian setting uh, where anything can happen from uh, a massive wedding slash cake slash axe fight to uh, chainsaws getting thrown at a wall to people rappelling down from the rafters. So it was gonna be my first time seeing it too. And uh, Meredith McDonough's it was slash is slated. Oh, yeah. Back, so I, was, I, yeah. I was slash am excited. Yeah. Um, so I was I was uh, excited to, to talk about this with you for many of the reasons that that you mentioned, especially um, Greek adaptation, um, which is something that you're quite well known for as well with, with the success of your play Eurydice. And I was curious um, what you felt like Chuck's project as an adapter was uh, in this play, what he was hoping to get from transposing this old story and, and telling it in you. <laughs> I'm so distracted by my dog. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Chuck. I I think you know he he says somewhere that one of the reasons he loves going to the Greeks is that the plot he says is like a Rolls Royce, like you know it's going to run well. And and I what I find comforting about doing Greek adaptations is you always know there will be an ending. Um, <laughs> Oh my God, the dog, the dog. The children are behaving, but the dog. <laughs> um, so, you know, using that architecture, that sense that the wheels, the spokes, like they will go and you can put your thumbprint on it, but that the plot will go. And so I'm just gonna let my dog out of the room. So Chuck can, you know, oh, thank you, Hope, um, can add these, these glorious flights of language, these arias um, that are purely Chuck and that are very, very contemporary. Um, but then there's this sense of the of the ancient kind of supporting it and and carrying it through. Um, I'm curious too. Um, Big Love uh, is a highly produced play, uh, as is Eurydice. Um, I'm curious why you think specifically uh, these adaptations of, of Greek myths strike such a chord uh, in in modern America over the past couple decades. I mean, I think it, it never gets old, does it? Um, love, losing love through a glance. I mean, every great sort of musician and poet has cut their teeth on the Orpheus myth. I think it's that the themes are enduring because they're mysterious, because we don't know the answer. Why did he look? Was it wrong for him to look? Why Why is it so bad to look back to see if your lover is following you? You know, what? what is it to be faithless? Um, did she cry out? Did she surprise him? I mean, that was my sort of addition to the story, was the idea that she calls out and surprises him. Um, because I was so sick of Eurydice just being um, sort of behind the veil. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there's a life force in these myths. And I, and I think, too, we're hungry for myth because in America, we, you know, we live in this melting pot, which, which Chuck, I think, does so well, kind of 
drawing from many cultures to create um, a really contemporary sort of American idiom around the Greeks. Uh, but it means we don't necessarily share myths. We don't necessarily go to the theater and think, oh, I know, I, oh, Agamemnon, I know who that is. You know, our, our, um, our collective placeholders are quite different. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and sometimes we don't have them at all. Yeah. But I was, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I was, I was just reminded of, uh, of your play about the bushes, which is an attempt to, uh, to discuss, um, a more recent kind of American, uh, myth and archetype. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And now that seems like a hundred years ago, you know, the bushes, what? <laughs> I I'm uh, I really like that play. I didn't get to read it. Or uh, sorry, I didn't get to see it, but I read it and uh that's I think I'm I'm a fan of that one. Um mm -hmm. I do want to uh remind folks that if you have questions for Sarah Rule, uh you can ask her by typing into the uh chat window of your screen and we will be more than happy to answer that in the meantime i'm gonna keep asking her questions because i have lots <laughs> um so so sarah uh something that i that i wanted to to make sure i i asked you at this moment and and again um i feel like a, a theme we've been coming back to is that maybe we don't know the answers yet but you are really known um or at least i i think of you as a real theatrical innovator of uh, coming coming into the theater and breaking our ideas open of, of what we thought language could do, of the, the type of magic that we thought we could perform on stage. And I think something that I've been asking myself and, and a lot of people are is what is theatrical innovation going to look like now that we have this added uh, logistical problem of not being able to gather for who knows how long. Do you have a, a sense or an inkling I mean, I hope that the theatrical innovation doesn't go towards the digital, but rather away from it. You know, that when we come together, it's, um, you know, that we're desperate for a non-digital, unmediated experience again, and that we kind of flock back to that ritualistic, ancient sense of what theater is. Um, I mean, it's possible we might have to think in terms of scale really differently. We might have to think about doing plays for audiences of one, mm -hmm. doing plays for audiences of one or two or spacing them differently, doing plays. You know, I have this play called Stage Kiss where the main actress kisses everyone in the play, you know, at least once and kisses one person like 15 times. Like, how do you do that play in the time of COVID? Um, what, you know, will will this formally affect our choices or or will we find a vaccine and when we come back, we'll really come back? Uh, will there be this strange middle ground year where we're kind of back, but not really, and we're looking for plays that are socially distanced? Mm -hmm. You know, which seems like such an odd even phrase, a play that's socially distanced, what is that? Um, I have a play, Dear Elizabeth, and it's an adaptation of a, the letters between Robert Lowell and Elizabeth Bishop, and they basically sit at desks on either side of the stage. So you, you could do that play, I suppose, um, in the time of COVID if your audience was staggered. But there will come a point where we want massive casts um, and their bodies entangled, you know, doing all the, all the ritual things that they can do. So I don't think any of us really knows, but I do think for most theater folk I talk to, there there is a um, a, a deep acknowledgement that the Zoom genre is is a lovely placeholder, but it's it's not the same thing. Yeah. Um, we do have some questions coming in. Uh, one is is quite long but wonderful, um, and uh, it is from Alex Haddad. Hi, long time no see to you too. Um, so the question is: sometimes something that I'm interested in is the theme of youth in the context of epic narratives. Passion play, especially, has been a work I come back to over and over. As a young person just about to come into the theater world or whatever that world would look like. Um, Passion play is also about a world that is ending as it confronts war and suffering. 
So I guess the, the question is, how do you view uh, youth in the context of the epic and the mythic? What role does youth have? Oh my God, my dog. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. I've just been thinking about this question because I've been going back to the, the myth of um, the play Alcestis and thinking about doing an adaptation of it. Um, and you have the kind of um, Hercules who has this massive party in the house of the dead, not the house of the dead, but a house of mourning. Um, so you have the sense of death and dying, but then you have the sense of life force and youth and parties, and which of course makes me think of all the, um, you know, crazy spring break partiers in Florida during time the time of COVID. Uh, so I think, you know, passion play is part of a medieval cycle tradition where things go in circles and time goes in circles. And if you think about life cycles, you know, youth and age are just two sides of the same circle. So um, I don't know if that's really answering your question, but I do think it's it's interesting to look at youth as kind of renewal, youth as life force in this, you know, eternally recurring circle. Yeah, and, and interesting too in this question is also uh, the fact that yes, passion play, I mean, to to live in the Middle Ages was to live within plague and death, kind of right. so much closer than, than we've come to have a relationship with it. Yeah. The play feels like it's about that as well. Thank, thank you, Alex. Um, so you've got another question. Uh, Sarah, what have you learned about yourself and your work since you started teaching? What does mentorship mean for the upcoming generation of playwrights? I, I don't know what I've learned full stop, but thank you. Can you take the dog out like oh, yeah, indefinitely? Sure. <laughs> Um, I just, I adore teaching. I love it. Um, and I learn from my students continually. Uh, speaking of youth and renewal, I mean, I think it's such an incredibly renewing thing to be teaching, um, to see the great renaissance that, that is in the American theater. I mean, it's, it's endlessly exciting, uh, my, my former students are doing such beautiful work. Going to the Carlotta Festival every year at Yale School of Drama is one of my favorite things and often some of the best theater I've seen all year mm -hmm. at the Carlotta Festival. And it's incredibly sad to me this year that there will be no Carlotta Festival, that there will be no graduation, that we're missing, you know, again, marking time in that way. Mm -hmm. um, the question was, what did I, what do I learn? What do I learn from teaching? What have, what have you learned about yourself or your work? Um, and mm -hmm. what does mentorship mean for the upcoming generation of playwrights? Well, the first part of the question is so hard for me to answer, but the second part is easy, easier to answer because mentorship is, is everything. Mm -hmm. And I think um, in, in, Amer in American art forms, we really undervalue mentorship because we like to think of, um, artists as being brash and original, which of course, that's great. We should all be brash and original, but that doesn't mean that you don't have a kind of lineage that you're part of. Yeah. And in the old, you know, actor model, that was how you learned how to act was you got taken under an older actor's wing in a production you kind of were mentored in and you learned through doing. Mm -hmm. um, I would not be a playwright were it not for Paula Vogel and, and that kind of, really direct mentorship. I taught a class at Yale uh, a year ago called The Teachings of My Teachers, which was really fun for me. And we we read Paula, we read Mac Wellman, Nilo Cruz, and Maria Irene Fornes, and I would teach their work, but then I would also try to teach their pedagogy um, because I learned from all of them and they're such different teachers. And I felt like it was useful for I hoped for the students to see where I came from and to see what what that lineage is, but also to see that there are many ways of teaching. And just because you don't connect with a certain kind of teaching doesn't mean that you won't connect with another way of teaching playwriting. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, speaking personally, uh, your your class was a, a real, a true high point uh, of, of my education. And I know that's true for so many people. Um, I also have such distinct memories of encountering Dave Harris's work for the first time in, in your- Oh school. my God. Yes, amazing, right? Just, and look at him now. Shooting star on the way to no. fortune. Shout out to Dave Harris. Yeah, Hello, Dave Harris. <laughs> um, We've got another question here, and it is about the Greeks. Um, and it is uh, if oh, they're curious if you have an extensive background in Greek myth or tragedy, uh, and or if you read Greek. I I'm so sad. I don't read Greek. Um, no, I don't. I tried to learn Latin uh, when I was writing Eurydice, so I could read the Virgil and Ovid in the original, and then I got way too entranced with learning Latin. Uh, and and not with writing my play, so I dropped it. <laughs> but no, I don't. I don't know Greek, but I did study a lot of the classics as an undergraduate and toyed with being a classics major. But obviously, my lack of Greek <laughs> was a major impediment. <laughs> but I, I had one um, teacher in particular, David Constan, who is a Greek scholar who taught a class called Ancient Tragedy and Its Influence, and I took it. Um, freshman year. And funnily enough, my husband was in that class too, but we never knew each other. Uh, we met a long time later. Oh. Um, uh, I'm also, uh, uh, while, um, while we have a couple more minutes, if folks want to continue asking questions, I wanted to make sure uh, we asked you uh, just before we went on air, uh, whether there were specific uh, orgs that you feel like are doing a great job uh, supporting artists currently. And I wanted to make sure that you got a chance to mention both of those. So the trickle up, I just think is astonishing. So it, everyone should subscribe to the trickle up. Uh, Taylor Mack began it and shocking how quickly he did it. And then, you know, just this short amount of time, he's given $10,000 uh, to three artists. Um, so basically when you, when you put your name in, or sorry, when you put your work up, you put someone's name in who you know to be adversely affected by this particular crisis financially and in, in need and, and who you think would make beautiful content on the site. So you put their name in a box or a hat or a virtual hat, and then they get picked out. Um, and then you get asked to put work online. And what's wonderful about the content is it's things you normally would get to see. Um, so you see Paula Vogel reading from Memoirs in Progress. Um, you see Lynn Nottage creating this amazing story. Kathleen Chalfant reads a Virginia Woolf story. Um, I read a couple poems. Uh, Taylor reads from his play, Gary. So you see artists doing things they normally wouldn't be asked to do. And, and there's such a real human thumbprint and directness to the to the charity because it goes to a person in the theater community that the theater community knows is, is in need. And $10,000 really makes a crucial difference in an artist's life. Um, so that, and then Homebound is um, another amazing venture that Jenna Warsham has been spearheading. And it's, I think, 10, 10 short plays that, that you get tickets to. Uh, we just had our first one last night and all of that money goes to no kid hungry, which is incredibly important right now because apparently one out of five kids are hungry right now under COVID in America. Um, and she raised, or the, the venture raised $31,000 when we last checked. Oh so my that, God. Yeah. It's a lot of meals for a lot of kids. Wow. Congrats. That's, that's amazing. I didn't realize it was already that amount. Congratulations. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, Sarah, I believe that is about all of our time. I want to let you get back to <laughs> this is my dog. dog. Oh, yeah. um, but thank you so much. We at, at Roundhouse uh, are so grateful uh, that you um, you have made the time for us. And I think I was trying to play it too cool to say it in undergrad, but your work truly changed oh. my life more than any artist. So. Oh, yeah. It is a personal thrill to get to talk to you again. Thank you so much. I love seeing you anytime, and I love seeing you on Zoom. <laughs> uh, can't wait to see you in the fall.
Yes. Thank you so much, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Have a good night. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. All right. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Playwrights on Plays. If you'd like to read Paula Vogel's Baltimore Waltz or Chuck Me's Big Love, you can do so online at the links that we are providing. This series will continue weekly uh, at on Thursdays at 7 p.m. And next, we'll be welcoming Roundhouse Theater commissioned playwright Tim J. Lord as he discusses another Chuck Me play, Iphigenia 2.0. Thank you to our tech support, Johnny Monday, our composer, Nat Wheel Matt Nielsen, and the Roundhouse Theater Marketing Department. Uh, in the meantime, till next week, I encourage you to check out Roundhouse Theater's website for additional content, especially Homebound, a different Homebound, uh, our web series about life in the nation's capital during a pandemic. And if you're financially able, please consider a donation to the Roundhouse Resilience Fund. We are still within a matching period uh, with our generous board of trustees. So any dollar that you give will go double towards supporting Roundhouse and making sure that we are able to continue producing amazing artists like Sarah Rule. Be well, take care of yourselves, and I will see you next week. <laughs>